the, the third one can happen because in between the interval when it decides to block. So if you try it three times, then it permanently, not permanently, but it adds you for a very long time to the blacklist.ev file. For a week. For a week. At minimum a week. And this ends up being closer to 10 to 20 days. So the, the moral of the story is it ends up being fantastic because I only get like a handful of warnings now because then, oh, you're gone. In fact, we can take a look at the running system and see just how many things it's blocked. Now, how it's doing this is uh, kind of, it supports all sorts of different operating systems. And on Linux, it does IP tables. It can call a random script. So you could actually have this call out to some kind of gateway device and ask the gateway device, hey, these, these dudes are attacking me. You should block them. And if you had like a larger network where you put one gateway, you could protect a bunch of machines. So you attack, you know, you attack one of us, you attack us all. Uh, in a situation where you have multiple machines with public IPs. So that that's how World War I started. Hmm. <laughs> that's, how, that's what NATO is, for that matter. So, I mean, all right. So, what it does is it adds a chain to IP tables called SSH guard. Does it? Oh, that's my local machine. Durr. By the way, no, sudo is nice. Oh, it doesn't have, I don't have the coloring over here. It's very boring. See how boring it is without the colors? I also am on the server. What? I can spell. So it inserts a drop rule for a bunch of addresses. It's going to be interesting how many this is now, because it's been running this way for about a week. Yeah, see, you're seeing the Netherlands. The Netherlands is attacking me. So, Italy. I mean, attacked by Italy. Who gets attacked by Italy? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, attacked by .cn, which is one of the ones that Canadian totally not what you think. Or no, no C N is China. Oh. C H is Switzerland. Yes. Yeah. Something or other Helvetica. And dial whiz to jz dot com dot cn. Yeah, lots of those. So it is. It does end up being lots of China, but it also ends up being OVH, which is a hosting company. Um, not sure. I don't know if they're a good hosting company or bad hosting company. But obviously, <laughs> Thailand. Me and Thailand. What is dot bhn dot net? That's probably somebody actually fairly local, because that's right on networks. Yeah, um, that uh, that might have I been. I think that's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, good. And um, and if you look, if I look in the file, if I actually uh, SSH guard in the big log file, it has an amusing message where it prints out uh, how long it's banning things. But maybe it has an, uh, Maybe it's an off. For more than, <laughs> yeah, it's not saying what to say more than 20 danger and two attacks over zero seconds. So uh, it was, I thought it was showing it in days, but I might be thinking of something else. 20, 20, 20 danger, 20 danger. I can actually open the DB. 20 days. Oh, yeah, all 20 days. Oh, no, 20D. So 20D and one abuse is over that. So the D is the danger level. <laughs> So if you wanted to get, if you didn't want to be completely psychotically paranoid, uh, I believe that if you install SSH guard on an Ubuntu machine or a Debian machine, that it comes pre-configured. Actually, even on an Arch Linux machine, it comes pre-configured. So all you have to do is make sure the service starts up. It'll start slurping your log files and then blocking people that are trying to log into your boxes. So uh, it's pretty, it's really good for, for set it and forget it. You don't have to do crazy weird things to break the internet, like running SSH on a different port number. Um, I'd much rather know that I, I view this as a, a benefit. I know that all of these IPs are crap, and I don't want to talk to them. That's what running the SSH server tells me to do. I can't visit the, uh, if I was connecting through this machine, like if this was my desktop at home, I can't connect to these sites anymore. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, it's not wonderful if they figure out a way of lying, like doing header forging like we were talking about. But I'd much rather know that these people are, are peeing on me than just to ignore them by hiding. And just, it's just blocking the host, not the users? 
It's blocking no. everything. It's blocking all packets. I mean, but from that particular host. <clears throat> yes. So if they happen to guess a valid username on your system. And they manage to have a copy of my, my private key. Well, without your private key. So mm. they're, but that user does not get blocked. Even if the username is valid. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's just the IP address. Yeah. So this just black holes the IP address. Yeah. I don't care about usernames. Um, otherwise, Andy would be blocked all the time. Because um, <laughs> you're at the beginning now. But you would believe how many, how many times people try to log in as you. Know. I, I probably would not be surprised, actually. Okay, yeah, 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 boxes at home. So how do you go about removing one of these from, just say, you, you actually log in, crap, I'm at my friend's house, I need to remove. Uh, uh, the way I've been doing it is I've just been uh, removing the IP tables rule that's it. myself. The other thing you can do, you can bypass it. It has its own whitelisting mechanism. But uh, what I've done to whitelist it is I just add a rule before the SSH guard chain that just automatically uh, accepts the connection from an IP. So okay. the SSH guard never gets invoked. It's actually cool. I've learned uh, I've learned a lot about IP tables lately. I enjoy using it now. Just in time for NF tables to come out. All right. So that was that talk. Um, Before you leave that that topic of discussion. I saw that you had like a, a blacklist there it is a blacklist database. That's just yeah. the one that that's the one that you created. That's they create it. They create it creates it automatically. So if you're more than twenty, if you're more than the minimum danger threshold, right. it adds you to that, which means it persists across across reboots. Okay. So there's nothing there's nothing that the, the SSH card people put out that says, hey, here's a blacklist like um, no. Anything else? But I'll share my database with you if you want. <laughs> be an interesting kind of community effort. Well, what you should what you should really do is make it so that the blacklist gets shared over BitTorrent, and that way everybody just gets an updated blacklist automatically all the time. That would be possible to game that though. So, but yeah, that would be fun. That would be a fun thing to do. That almost sounds like what they're trying to do with the SSL certs. Um, to produce a distributed set of voting system on whether or not a cert's valid instead of using a central certificate authority. Well, that would be cool. Um, I'm trying to remember who was running a big one. I know EFF was uh, doing one. Lots of people are using the perfect forward security thing, which is also good. So uh, that was that. and. Uh, uh, if, if you're wondering, this is a system D file. Uh, has anyone been reading about system D and is scared about it? Like I have, I can, I have some stats that are somewhat useful and related. Yes, I'd like to see this. Okay, so one of the things I hear about system D is uh, people are worried it's monolithic and. Uh, this is the replacement for syslog, correct? No, system no, D is a replacement oh. for init. Okay, that's right. So uh, I'm listing every file that belongs to systemd, uh, and then seeing if the file is a binary. I should actually check for shell scripts too, but I think this is a fairly listed number. This is the number of separate executables that ships with systemd. Uh, so systemd has a lot of functionality, but I hardly even think that it has enough functionality for 71 executables. So in my mind, like just uh, heuristically, I think that systemd is actually pretty lightweight because each of I probably could replace any one of those executables. Um, the, the biggest dependency being it has on Dbus, but Dbus is really not much more than a structured pipe. So I mean, it, I don't, I'm not really worried about its level of complexity. Uh, some people were worried that maybe um, if the people doing systemd went away, could someone else take it over? I, I think it, I think as software projects go, it's far from being too monolithic. I would be more worried about. I mean, other than the fact there's so many people working on it, I'd be more worried about the kernel. Because there, the kernel is a lot of specialist knowledge, and I don't nothing that system is really doing is all that specialist. It's just doing it a bit better than has been done before. And it is really great that everyone's standardizing on it. I see that without the WC. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's see. Probably best if I grep out only things that begin with a slash, because otherwise it's going to have the Oh, it's actually, well, why is it? It's really the wrong line. Yeah. So everything. So, uh, let's see. Everything after the colon. Yeah. This is uh, not really dissuading people with command lines are easy, so yeah. There's <laughs> 
UDEP thing, system D, D console, set up, set up uh, user sessions, update U temp. So I think these are all, if these were shell scripts, they could be shell scripts, just like before. I think the reason they're executables is that it's a bit faster startup wise, which is a major goal. Because I mean, uh, update U temp is something that's, that's a, a task that it has done for a long time. So uh, let's, let's try to script out, uh, skip out all the lib system D stuff. So, because those are obvious, I mean, those are obviously all like library routines. So, uh, so that's still a lot. So, if without the libs, I want to know how many number, how many things that is. It's only about thirty or forty. Well, there's only seventy-two with them, so. 32, very good guess. So about half of them are library things, which are probably would be either shell scripts themselves or, or shell functions. Um, these are user, I know for a fact that these are at least uh, like system D inhibit, system D, I don't know about notify, but system D inhibits a user level command so, or something that a login manager runs to inhibit certain operations that system D is in charge of. And this is the thing I really like, so system D on a machine is responsible not just for normal init stuff, which is, by the way, confined to its own process one, but it has helper things for monitoring the state of the laptop, such as suspend when the lid closes, and it's not hooked up to a VJ, and it's not hooked up to a V, no, it did not go to sleep. Um, if it were not hooked up to a VGA, it would have suspended. It's also responsible for if I were to hit the sleep button, which I'm not going to do because I'm not sure what that will do, but it does normally work. And it's also responsible for the power button, which I'm not going to do, but it's very nice on machines without monitors. You can hit the power button, it just turns off, and it's kind of like part of the autonomic system of, of the machine now because you don't have to worry about it. Is, AC, is the ACPI daemon running waiting to receive events from the kernel telling it that the power button has been pressed? Or should process one just know to shut down the computer when the power button is pressed? But what if you don't want to do that? Then you call systemd inhibit from a shell script, or you send a message to systemd using dbus saying, I want to inhibit the power button. In it all, it, it's really nice. So I think it's nice, and uh, I think that the, the best argument is that Arch Linux, which is like the super crazy people that don't like complicated things, switch to it. Uh, Debian is probably switching to it, and Ubuntu is if Debian switches to it, Ubuntu, who has their own competing replacement, are going to switch to it. They're like, yeah, well, we wrote this upstart thing, but if man, if Debian, if the Debian community thinks the system is better, then we'll just have to rethink. Uh, I'm kind of out of topics now, so if anyone else has something to say, that I can say. Uh, I hope, uh, anyway, so I hope if you run an SSH server, if you ever run an SSH server, install SSH guard, and maybe eventually people will stop doing SSH things. I mean, it's almost like they're doing a service. They're, they're hunting down and finding these vulnerable machines. And then eventually someone notices that they were vulnerable. And, and then the herd gets more immune to them, probably. So, Matt, have you been working on any cool projects lately? Where he's like, that you can share with the group? Not really. Yep. I mean, you can see that. He's the leader of 